Oh, so I want to welcome you to uh, this last uh, social science education lecture of the season. And I want to thank you guys for your uh, participation and your loyalty throughout the year. And uh, I think that's really important for all of us. I am <laughs> Nina Rosenstand, and uh, I teach philosophy here at Mesa, and I'm an ethicist, and uh, among other things. I write textbooks, uh, I write uh, papers, uh, and I you know, sometimes get published. And uh, the sixth edition of my moral of the story, which is a uh, textbook in ethics that came out last fall, and this is one of the ways I thought that I might celebrate it with you. So, without further ado, here is uh, today's talk, which is called Ethics on the Brain. And this happens to be my first PowerPoint supported paper. So this is a bit of an experiment. And um, uh, I do maintain my old misgivings about PowerPoint presentations, that pictures are good for the eyes to rest on while the speaker talks, just like sermons in the decorated medieval churches in Europe. Uh, but words on the screen should, should support the spoken word, not compete with it. Uh, so at the end, I hope I will have succeeded in striking that balance. So this slide here gives you the topic and the brain with two illustrations, and they're both significant. Uh, one is an evocative image showing the ability of the human mind to sparkle in its connections to the world. The other one is your brain on donuts. <laughs> it, this depends on whether you actually know the series that this has been taken from. And if not, it's not going to mean much to you, but if I say Homer Simpson, it might ring a bell. Okay. Uh, and this kind of gives the entire spectrum of human brain activity right there. Uh, so this talk here is actually a work in progress, and I will probably be giving it, or a later version of it, in Monterey uh, next, in next, uh, next academic year. And I want to mention that neurobiology is uh, by no means my field of expertise. It's an area where I've done some research lately, because uh, I find it fascinating. And chances are that there are some of you who know a whole lot more about neurobiology than I do. And I hope that during our um, questions and answers session, we can get into that. Um, so my approach is from moral theory. But in addition, I also work within a philosophy of human nature. So this is where my paths emerge into this uh, topic here. I can't tell you all that much about the science behind these findings, but I can talk about how I think the entire phenomenon of the collaboration between philosophers and scientists might affect our views on moral behavior and social priorities, and what it means for our understanding of being human in a descriptive and normative sense. And what this really is, is a story with pictures of one of the most fascinating cross-disciplinary phenomena right now. In the long tradition of moral philosophy, it has mostly been assumed that it's our rationality that allows us to make appropriate moral decisions. Emphasizing the power of reason to think morally is a thread that runs through the writings of Plato, Aristotle, Thomas Aquinas, John Locke, Immanuel Kant, Jeremy Bentham, uh, and up to most of today's thinkers, including John Rawls and Christine Karsgaard and Peter Singer. And the assumption is and was that the power of reason not only allows us to be smart about our moral choices, which would be self-serving, uh, but reason simply makes the right moral decision seem compelling even if the end result might not be beneficial to ourselves. Different philosophers take this faith in reason in different directions, such as utilitarianism, which looks at creating good consequences for as many as possible, and duty theory or deontology, which focuses on whether moral actions can be universalized or whether we can imagine everybody else doing what we intend to do. But what they have in common is this assumption that reason is the only legitimate driving force in moral thinking. Another theory says that morality is indeed supported by reason, but it is the reasoning of selfish prudence. What's in it for me or the per perpetuation of my genetic material? This is what we call the veneer theory, implying that morality is a thin veneer stretched over a fundamentally self-serving human nature. And Thomas Hobbes, <coughs> excuse me, would be the modern ancestor uh, to this theory. But then there's a theory that moral values originate in our emotions. <coughs> In the history of philosophy, this idea represents an aberration. Only a small number of thinkers, the so-called sentimentalists, have suggested that the foundation of our entire system of moral rules and justifications is a matter of feelings. I will mention two names in particular, uh, and then we'll get back to them in a few minutes, and that would be David Hume and Jean-Jacques Rousseau. But we can add that contemporary moral philosophy 
has the notion that emotions should not be seen as irrelevant to moral philosophy. And that idea is shared by philosophers Martha Nussbaum and Emmanuel Levinas and Richard Taylor and others. Um, but for most of the 20th century, philosophers and especially ethicists have maintained that scientific data are irrelevant for moral theory. This is a long-standing philosophical discussion between two viewpoints that have been considered fundamentally opposed. Whether moral statements or propositions can be reduced to non-moral statements, with a viewpoint that's known as naturalism, or whether moral statements are irreducible, which we call non-naturalism. And if science somehow is able to show that there is a true natural foundation for morals, then I suppose non-naturalism will have to step up to the challenge. So philosophers, as diverse as their opinions might be otherwise, have generally sided with a non-naturalist stance and kept a distance to scientific research. But the last five, six years have seen a shift in this approach, partly thanks to new research in neurobiology and partly thanks to a handful of philosophers who've taken up the cue. So this is where we get the new crossover phenomenon. And um, this has actually been happening in the last 10, 15 years or so. Interesting movements in between disciplines where academic disciplines have most often been isolated from each other. <clears throat> each discipline's very legitimate search for its own results and identity. There's been a growing interest in crossing over and applying the knowledge and methods in one discipline to the material and experience of another. But scholars who reach across the borders of their discipline to connect with scholars from other fields are often viewed as traitors in their field, like both disciplines. And uh, Daniel Bennett has actually talked extensively about that. Uh, however, this rapprochement uh, yields interesting results that could not have been achieved uh, without the cooperation of people from different scholarly backgrounds. And when that is the case, it provides a really powerful incentive to, for more cooperation. And in philosophy in particular, we have uh, some crossover phenomena that I can mention, and there are probably others, but these are the ones that, that I know the most about. Uh, philosophy and literature. Philosophers and literary critics are now getting together, building bridges that allow the literature people to pursue philosophical thought in literature, and philosophers to read some good stories with a moral to them. And that is a crossover field that I'm involved in myself. So this is actually where I know more about it than neurobiology. Uh, but then there are ethicists and evolutionary psychologists who get together to explore the development of moral values in early hominids and even in non-human primates. And sometimes some of these people are actually both philosophers and <coughs> engineering psychologists. Uh, the field, of course, we're going to talk about today is the crossover phenomenon of ethics uh, and neurobiology. And in this picture here, which relates to the next slide also, it's from last year, actually exactly a year ago, and uh, what we have here is a festival uh, where this particular session had, okay, uh, this would be John Meacham from Newsweek, who is um, the moderator. We have Mark Hauser here, we have Daniel Bennett, we have Antonio Damasio, and we have Patricia Tursley. So, this slide here, uh, I just put it in because I love the picture. Uh, and this came from this uh, World Science Festival 2008. And there is one this year also, and maybe this has been running for years, I just didn't know about it. Had I known about this, I, I think I would have made an effort to be there, because uh, this is the kind of stuff that I do. So this session here was called What It Means to Be Human. And uh, as you can see, a whole array of people, and I have all their names, if anybody wants to know who they are later on. Uh, so, and I assume that this was a very congenial group, because it, it looks that way, it kind of looks like uh, Father Time sitting right there in the middle, uh, but that is Daniel Dennett. And uh, you know, I was, this is my own interpretation, which is, I assume, wrong. But look at the human family right there. Uh, I looked at him and said, okay, that's a uh, you know, nice typical family, mom and dad, and, and two little girls with an athletic, tall-looking mom and an athletic, tall-looking dad. Mm -hmm. I don't know if this looks like anything to you, but to me this looks like the first family. And I am sure it's not because this is in May, so they weren't really on the radar politically yet, but it just, uh, so. We can make out of that anything we want. But uh, <laughs> this is the, okay, what's coming up now is the only slide that I will ask you to read with me. Okay, otherwise I'm gonna spare you that uh, approach. But it just tells you what ambitious program the whole idea of combining science and morality has. So, Science, investigating the biological roots of empathy, altruism, 
cooperation to discover whether we possess an innate moral grammar, much like language, or whether morality arises from the interaction among biological <coughs> and social systems. Notice it doesn't say anything about um, uh, whether it's something we learn as we go along. That one's not in there. Um, so, okay, next one. In this presentation, which was the, uh, uh, you know, another session. In this presentation, uh, blah, 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 philosophers Patricia Churchland, Daniel Dennett, um, neuroscientist Antonio Damasio, evolutionary biologist Mark Hauser, discussed the science of right and wrong and explored how our scientific understanding of morality may affect our society from shaping justice systems to deciding whether to engage in wars or to assist others in economic and humanitarian struggles. I mean, that is an awesome agenda. That, that, this will solve a lot of problems. So maybe, maybe not. Um, so this is where I'm going to uh, show you some of these people who are involved. And by the way, if anybody cares to later on in our uh, second hour, or maybe uh, you know just uh, contact me personally, these uh, links are all clickable. They are all videos from the internet where we can actually look at these people talking. So I was surprised that I could do that in a PowerPoint presentation, but apparently I can because I tried. Uh, the only one I couldn't find video for is Joshua Green. Uh, I'm sure that's coming, uh, but I couldn't find anything. Perhaps the most important, maybe not, perhaps the most interesting uh, is Antonio Damasio. So there he is. Um, and he's the author of uh, a number of books, uh, including Descartes' Error, The Feeling of What Happens, and Looking for Spinoza. And just based on these titles, I think you can tell one reason why I find him interesting, because he finds philosophy interesting. He will, from his professional background, go into classical philosophy and look for precursors among philosophers and ethicists in particular. And he likes Spinoza, and so do I. So there's a nice connection. And I consider him one of the best bridge builders between the disciplines. He researches the neurological foundations of emotion, memory, language, and consciousness. And right now, he's at the University of Southern California and also over at the Salk Institute. Uh, a completely different scholarly personality and also with different goals is uh, V.S. Ramachandra. Um, and he's associated with UCSD. So a lot of these key players actually have Southern California connections. So this is one of the hotbeds of, of uh, this research right now. Uh, and he has made significant strides in brain research and broadening our understanding of phenomena such as phantom limbs and synesthesia, which I find really interesting, and language, in particular, the natural connection between shapes and words. And he's done work, and he's actually, in this country, he would be the go-to guy for the mirror neuron theory, which we're going to talk about. Uh, but he has an enormous disdain for philosophers. And if we're going to find that in his research that can help us understand ourselves as moral beings, it will have to be without his help. But his theories stand on his own, so that's OK. We don't have to be chummy with him. Um, in particular, his explanation of how patients with phantom limbs and other brain anomalies try to come up with acceptable explanations for their unusual experiences is something that I find interesting as a part of narrative philosophy. Why do we tell stories to get a grip on our chaotic reality? But he himself is not interested in that angle at all, and I know because I've tried to discuss it with him. So <laughs> that one is out. Um, next one, Mark Hauser. So uh, Ramachandra was not part of that science uh, festival, but uh, Damasio, Hauser, Dana, Dennett, and Churchland was. So Mark Hauser uh, is an evolutionary biologist and psychologist. So here's that crossover again. Here we have the evolutionary uh, psychology coming into the picture. And he wrote Moral Minds, How Nature Designed Our Universal Sense of Right and Wrong. And he's presently at Harvard. And he is the one who has developed the theory of a natural moral grammar built into our brain structure. And I want to quote to you what he said recently, and this is quoted from C Magazine, which I also have the link for if anybody wants it. Uh, the most exciting developments today sit at the intersection between science and philosophy. It's an intersection that causes angst in many and shivers of excitement in others. I am of the shivering type and especially for this problem, by thinking about our moral knowledge in the same way that many linguists think about our knowledge of language, we raise deep and surprisingly unsettled questions. Is there a universal moral grammar? Is there a critical period for acquiring our moral knowledge? Is our moral organ a dedicated circuit for computing the moral rights and wrongs? 
do we see a glimmer of our evolutionary past in the moral capacity of our furry cousins? Oh, okay. So he wants to extend the field to uh, beyond the human realm. Okay, then there's Joshua Green. And uh, he is another neurobiologist who's also a psychologist. And in addition, he has a degree in philosophy. So there we really have, there we have all of them in one. And he too is at Harvard, and he's, as far as I can tell, the youngest of these players. He's really only been in the field of philosophy since 2002. But he's making his presence felt already. No books yet, but lots and lots of professional papers. And this is what he says on his web page. And I have that link too. Uh, rationalist philosophers, such as Plato and Kant, conceived of mature uh, moral judgment as a rational enterprise, as a matter of appreciating abstract reasons that in themselves provide direction and motivation. In contrast to these philosophers, sentimentalist philosophers, such as David Hume and Adam Smith, argued that emotions are the primary basis for moral judgment. I have proposed, so I'm continuing here, I have proposed a dual process theory, so this is him talking, I have produced a dual process theory of moral judgments according to which characteristically deontological moral judgments, which is judgments associated with concerns for rights and duties, are driven by automatic emotional responses. Some of us are going to have a problem with that. Uh, while characteristically utilitarian or consequentialist moral judgments, judgments aimed at promoting the greater good, are driven by more, co more controlled cognitive processes. If I'm right, the tension between deontological and consequentialist moral philosophies reflects an underlying tension between dissociable systems in the brain. Many of my experience employ moral dilemmas adapted from the philosophical literature that are designed to exploit this tension and reveal its psychological and neural underpinnings. End of quote. This is what makes Green a so-called experimental philosopher, a field that is in rapid development, which some philosophers have great hopes for and others find vastly overrated. Now we go to Dennett. To philosophers, Daniel Dennett is probably the most familiar name. He's been in the philosophy business for many years and is well known for his consciousness studies with an eye to evolutionary biology and cognitive science. His books include Darwin's Dangerous Idea, Conscious, Consciousness Explained, and Freedom Evolves, and the latter one um, yeah, where he argues in favor of the theory of compatibilism or soft determinism. I'll mention that briefly later on. Uh, and then we have Patricia Churchland. And she is a well-known philosopher at UCSD and at the Salk Institute. And her books include The Computational Brain and Brainwise Studies in Neurophilosophy. So now here we have a new concept, neurophilosophy, not just neurobiology. Uh, Churchland represents an interesting crossover philosopher for me. Because in her biography, she has until recently been listed as a neurophilosopher. Recently. I think with that conference, she has become a neuroethicist. And I didn't know such an animal existed. But we can call ourselves what we want. What is interesting to me is that I know of several other philosophers who have started out in philosophy of mind, a very rigorous science-oriented field, and found themselves moving closer to the more fuzzy area of ethics. Because they realize you can't have one without the other when you're trying to map the human creature and her ways. And here I am, meeting them in the middle, because I'm traveling the other way, from ethics toward an interest in neurobiology. Because I found you really can't talk about moral theory and close your eyes to what the latest green research is saying about human and animal <coughs> consciousness, free will, memory, empathy, and so on. Now, this is a short list of key players, but I think these are the most essential names. Some might say I should have included Stephen Pinker and Richard Dawkins, because they approach the question of ethics from a scientific point of view. But both are evolutionary psychologists rather than neuroethicists, so I had to make a choice to exclude them in this particular presentation. That doesn't mean their views aren't relevant. I'll mention Pinker later on just briefly. Neurobiological challenge number one, because there's going to be two slides. Uh, so, neurobiology <coughs> may now be at a stage where, according to Green and Dennett and Churchland in particular, some of the oldest questions in philosophy are beginning to find answers. So I'll tell you about a few findings, 24 of them all together, uh, and each one has enormous potential for our understanding of ourselves as moral agents. And I'm saying potential, it doesn't mean that, that I think everything is explained, but it can help. One thing is a moral brain center. In the 1990s, both book reviews and newspapers reported that Antonio Damasio had found the moral center of the brain. 
And I was very impressed with that piece of info. So I put it in my textbook in Ethics too, the moral of the story. Uh, because Damasio and other neuroscientists have found that test subjects with damage to a certain area in the prefrontal cortex had become unable to make moral choices. According to the study, as it was reported, healthy brains, this is really, really shorthand for that, healthy brains um, can identify moral issues and act on moral decisions, but those with damaged brains either were not able to act on decisions they made or simply couldn't identify a moral issue at all, let alone act on it. Aside from the scandal of phrenology in the 19th century, that was, to my knowledge, the first time anyone had had the audacity to claim that moral, morality resides in a specific area in the brain. As it turned out, that really wasn't the much I had meant either. That was what the New York Times and other publications created uh, as a convenient catchphrase for what the research was all about. And it made the Maja quite upset. Um, he actually uh, writes about it in uh, Looking for Spinoza, how he was upset about this moral center of the brain. Um, so the research uh, certainly involves uh, damaged brain areas, says the Masio, but moral decisions are not that localized. However, in 2007, a new study came out with Damasio and Hauser and others actually showed that a very specific brain area, the ventromedial prefrontal cortex, is the seat of activity where we make moral decisions, and those decisions are based on our social emotions. Uh, again, they used healthy test subjects as well as six test subjects with damage to that area of the brain and another group with damage to another brain area and those with damage to the ventromedial area yielded surprising results. While the two other groups struggled with moral solutions that would save the many but sacrifice the few, the ones with ventromedial damage had an easier time deciding on sacrificing the few. So Damasio and the others concluded that a healthy ventromedial prefrontal cortex gives rise to the social emotions of guilt, embarrassment, and compassion. And they are primary, allowing us to make quick moral decisions without thinking about them. From the standpoint of evolutionary psychology, we've had that brain area since Cro-Magnon times, when it was sufficient, but now life is more complex, and the immediacy of emotional reactions isn't always enough, but the bottom line is for Tomasio and the others that the emotional system of respect for human life, in other words, empathy and compassion, is hardwired into our brains. In a sense, what is new about this idea that we have natural empathy is that it can be proved neurologically. The idea itself isn't new at all. Even Kant, the quintessential rational moralist, says that we have a natural disposition, natural disposition toward a reluctance to cause pain to other people. Kant says that. Oh, but what was the hypothetical situation the researcher presented the, the test subjects with? None other than the famous or infamous trolley problem. This was originally suggested by Philippa Foote and Judith Jarvis Thompson, who are two moral philosophers. And it comes in two versions, the switch version and the footbridge version. Here's the switch version. Imagine you're, on, you're at a trolley stop. You watch a trolley bearing down out of control toward an unsuspecting group of five people. It is in your power by flip, flipping a switch to divert the trolley to another track, but in that case, one innocent bystander who's standing there will die. So the question is whether this is permissible. And traditionally, according to the, uh, uh, both uh, Foots and Thompson's and uh, Damasio's research, most people would agree. But the footbridge version is different. Same out of control trolley, same five people. Mm -hmm. This time, the only way to save the five persons is to push a sixth person who's on the footbridge in front of the trolley. So, uh, this we want to ask is that morally permissible? And without any other options outlined by the experiment, and that could be a problem, um, most people say no. So, kill five people. If you don't want to kill that sixth person, yeah, that's not nice. Okay, then kill a sixth person. No, I don't want to. So it's not logic. Right? Um, so what moral philosophers have gotten out of that is that active killing, actively killing someone is more morally objectionable than letting someone die for the sake of others, even if the result is the same, and even if we can see that we need to save five lives. And in war, that is a well-known phenomenon. Again, they're not really saying anything new here. Oh, uh, it's harder for a soldier to be willing to shoot an enemy soldier or a civilian point blank than it is to push a button that sets off a bomb.
So maybe we're just illogical and squeamish. But what about the version used in Damasio's study, which involved boxcars, not trolleys, by the way. So, I'm not plagiarizing, I call it boxcars. Uh, and this is legitimate, it's a famous example. Uh, everybody was willing to flip the switch, all three groups. But one of the two groups behave, the two control groups, uh, the healthy brains and the brains with another damaged area. Uh, they behave normally and wouldn't throw a person in front of a boxcar. The ventral medial group had much less reluctance to physically sacrifice someone in order to help them, or to save others. So, Damasio concludes that, for one thing, we have a natural capacity for empathy. And second, we have an innate reluctance to physically harm individuals of our own species. And three, this natural empathy is somehow related to the ventral medial prefrontal cortex. So I would say that we are talking about a moral center of the brain in some, in some way, at least in one specific category. Uh, Joshua Green has his own version of that. Uh, and he says the footbridge scenario is more repugnant than the switch scenario because uh, with our normal uh, ventral medial area, we have a split brain problem, like you know, he says, between a cool utilitarian calculation and an ancient major emotional response. Uh, those with the damaged area don't have that reluctance, so there's no agonizing choice to make. The trolley problem and other similar drastic examples like, would you throw a dying passenger overboard a lifeboat if it could save the rest of the people if the boat sink? Okay, that's another one that they used. Uh, such examples have been widely, uh, widely criticized for being too simplistic and too schematic. Some philosophers, such as Martha Nussbaum, and myself in all modesty, uh, have suggested using good stories as examples of moral dilemmas instead of these unrealistic little mind benders. I've often used the movie Abandoned Ship based on a true story, where the scenario is the same, but with all the real life emotions and considerations that go with such a situation, including what happened to the passenger overthrowing Captain afterwards. He was sentenced for murder. So, that's a moral consideration too, right? But if we just focus on the outcome of this research, we see that the old assumption that we react first with our head rather than with our heart, and selfishly at that, seems not to hold water. We are at least not completely selfish by nature. This, of course, depends on what the scientists call moral decisions and what philosophers call moral decisions, whether they are in fact the same. And that may not be the case, and maybe we're going to talk about that too in the second. Other challenges. So, the mirror neuron theory. Since the 1990s, researchers in Italy and the US have been working on a theory of oh, parallel brain reactions between test subjects. Okay. Um, so, certain neurons in monkey brains and human brains, I would assume also ape brains, because there's got to be uh, a you know, link between monkeys and humans, uh, they seem to have a certain function. As a matter of fact, one Italian researcher was just looking at one neuron, and that yielded you know, the beginnings of all these results. Uh, because these neurons react similarly when the subject experiences something, and he or she observes someone else of their species having the same experience. Or shall we say, uh, somebody has an experience, you watch them having the experience, and your brain in some way mirrors the experience. It's not just, oh, I know what that feels like. It's some instant reaction, <laughs> instant reaction. So those neurons have been dubbed mirror neurons because presumably they give the individual the ability to understand what others are experiencing and perhaps even feeling. This finding has enormous philosophical potential because it answers the question of what we call the theory of mind the understanding that other people have mind activity, and in particular, what they might think and feel. And the mirror neurons are well named because apparently they allow each of us, based on our own experience, to extrapolate and duplicate in our own mind the experience of someone else doing a familiar task, such as drinking a beer, carrying something that looks heavy, embracing someone, etc. And we all know the feeling of watching a movie of someone uh, trying to do, uh, you know, hanging onto a ledge, and they're just drop of, of a thousand feet down, right? Uh, and uh, you know, they're, they're tensing all their muscles, and what do we do? We <laughs> touch our muscles, oh, uh, as if we could help them that way. Uh, you know, so we do that. Uh, and uh, it's fairly certain the entire commercial industry makes use of mirror neurons in their sales tactics. This person do this, don't you also want to do that? Now, I'm not sure if they are relying on actual 
mirroring experiences or simply mirroring potential experiences. I don't know. I, I can't read that from, from the research. But um, philosophically, with the discovery of mirroring neurons, it, it makes it not completely certain, but at least a little bit less likely that we are essentially social atoms disconnected from everything and everyone and fundamentally self-oriented which is a philosophy that has been so popular in the 20th century that it had almost no challenge. Ramachandran is actively involved in this research, like I said, and he believes that mirror neurons are linked to our capacity for imitation and for language. And he also thinks that autistic people may simply be lacking some mirror neurons. Other researchers, such as animal behaviorist Franz de Waal, uh, who's in Atlanta, a uh, Dutch researcher in Atlanta, uh, he takes the implications one step further and he links uh, the mirror neurons up to the capacity for empathy itself. And this has not been established yet, neither has uh, the autistic uh, theory. Uh, but there seems to be evidence pointing in that direction, at least in human brains. And although Deval will tell you that empathy is alive and well in eight brains, uh, you know, I'm not going to go there for now. That's what she did. But I do want to point a couple of things out that remember the uh, the uh, ventromedial uh, center is here. Okay, so no eyes and nose here. Ventromedial center is, is right around here, someplace in the middle. Uh, but the mirror neurons, they're nowhere near that. They're over here in the back, in the back of the brain. So this means that we cannot talk about one specific area that if we dismantle that, we get totally amoral people, uh, or everything occurs in one place. So Damascus' original complaint that the moral center of the brain is not just one place, that would be upheld by this theory of the, more, the uh, mirror nuance. I want you to see this. I, actually, I just found that on the web yesterday. <laughs> so I went in and quickly uh, added that to, that's why it's kind of scratched here. Um, because, okay, these, so this is uh, the mirror neuron theory. And by the way, anybody interested in these pictures, at the end of the slideshow is uh, a list of photo credits. So you can, I can show you where I got them from. Uh, so this is a pianist playing. Okay. These arrows lighting up. This is a pianist listening. That says the brains don't look the same, you can obviously tell these are different people. Okay. Um, so, and this is a non musician listening. I don't know why this one is in there. A non-musician playing. <laughs> Who'd want to listen to that? I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, okay, I tried to play the piano, but I can't really. Um, so I, that one is, I think, pretty useless, although they, maybe, maybe they want to make another point. But what I want to show here is that uh, here's somebody who knows what they're doing, right? This is a pianist uh, playing, and this is a pianist listening. Um, same areas. Uh, so mirror neurons, probably, I mean, it looks like it's, it's going to be all over here, right? Um, same areas lighting up here. Not completely the same, but here we have to remember. And the website doesn't tell you this, but I'm just looking at this and I'm thinking, okay, what's the difference here? This person here, male or female, is probably reading a score and has to pay attention to uh, the technicalities of it and has to pay attention to the uh, the performance in itself. This guy here, male and female, does not have to do that because they're just sitting there enjoying it. And what I'm looking at, I looked at this yesterday and I thought, oh my goodness. Uh, look at these two areas. Look at these two areas. Look at these two areas. <coughs> if I can trust the colors, which I don't know, but I assume that color is lighting up and uh, red is lighting up and yellow is really, really lighting up. I don't know, so I shouldn't say too much here, but this is what I assume. This reaction is stronger than over here. That reaction is stronger than here. This reaction is stronger than here. I don't know what that is. Uh, but I could imagine, here I am absolutely speculating. I have no uh, evidence of that other than being a human being. But sometimes we empathize with people experiencing something to a greater degree than their actual joy or pain in the situation. And that could be because uh, if we experience it, we are preoccupied with dealing with the uh, practicalities. And this is the only thing that this person has to do is just zoom in on what it must feel like and enjoy it or feel the pain, whatever it is. So I don't know. Uh, it's, I would not put this in a paper to be published unless I have researched that in particular. But I can float it uh, for you now, and I would like to hear afterwards what you might think. 
Uh, and then, of course, if you're not a pianist, you can still have a wonderful experience. Like, oh, this is great, right? Um, so uh, you know, I can imagine uh, you know, this could be um, the Rhapsody in Blue. Okay, this playing Rhapsody in Blue. Da 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 <laughs> And then, oh, this is great. This is wonderful. Uh, the pianist is something not that exciting. This is just a piece of music, and you've got to get all parts right. But uh, this pianist listening is also able to enjoy itself. And that's probably what's going on. Uh, so that's why I'm thinking that, and this is just music, uh, all kinds of experiences, and you can throw that in. Okay. Um, and that's why, since this has to do with music, it is very appropriate to go to uh, the last one on the list of the challenges here. Because it's brand new. Just, it came out uh, in, in the news about uh, a month ago. And uh, it comes out of the Max Planck Institute of Berlin. Uh, EEG recordings of eight pairs of guitarists playing together reveal that their brain waves actually become synchronized while playing a number of versions of a jazz tune. The lead guitarist signals the beat. The other guitarist's brain starts adjusting. As they play, their brain waves are synchronized, which the researchers signify that the same neurons are activated. And I, I, didn't, I didn't have a picture of that, but it's pretty. I mean, if this is the kind of thing that happens, then we can see the pattern right there. And interestingly, it wasn't just in one brain area, but several, including mirror neurons area and close to the ventral medial prefrontal cortex also. And then, this is the kicker. The synchronization, they say, was associated with pleasant feelings. And the implications are fascinating. Because, for one thing, it's always nice to know that musicians love playing together. You know, kind of do that. They, they don't have to be forced to do that. But what about other activities that involve rhythm and timing? Now we may begin to understand that we are capable of being in sync with people doing the same organized activity. Uh, from music, I suppose, to military maneuvers, to ballet, and other physical performances, team sports, even sexual activities. Why not? Uh, because the notion of feeling one with another person may actually not be a poetic metaphor. Our brains may be swinging to the same beat. And that may, just take, may take us as far as finally comprehending collective religious and mystical experiences, as well as mass hysteria. Because as much as neurobiological research seems to lead us to conclude that we have a basic social nature which sounds good and benevolent, the moralist has to point out that there can be a definite downside to uncritically joining forces with others and start getting in sync with them. Oh, Jonestown, the rise of Nazism, gang activities, Heaven's Gate cult, lynch mobs. They're all examples of emotional group attachments, and they can be explained, perhaps, as social emotions gone wrong. So that really has some potential. Now, how has this research affected the debating moral view? It really is still in its infancy. So things are happening uh, all over the place. I see it going in a lot of different directions. But here I'm just going to explore two of them. And one is the old selfish altruism dichotomy. After that, we're going to explore the reason emotion dichotomy. And here's a brief <coughs> overview of what the philosophical tradition has come up with in terms of the selfish, unselfish, unselfish question. Some philosophers assume that we should fight our selfishness um, and that, that we can't do it. Uh, and that would be Kant, would be one of them, and John Rawls in modern times it would be uh, another. And uh, some philosophers think that we should pursue our selfishness for our own sake, and Hobbes would be one, and Ayn or Anne Rand would be another. Uh, and then there's uh, the completely opposite view, that uh, we are fundamentally compassionate by nature, and it's civilization that corrupts us. Mencius in China. I don't, we don't really have a lot of occasion to talk about other traditions here, but there's Mencius in China who believes that, and Rousseau in the uh, Enlightenment here. And of course, I'll get back to him. And the other Western person who says we have a natural compassion for compassion, if our own interests are not involved, that would be David Hume. So both of them are coming up. And then we have kind of a dark horse in the whole spectrum because this is a 20th, 20th century theory coming out of uh, France, and that is Emmanuel Levinas, who talks about that we always ought to, we're not unselfish by nature, but we certainly have that capacity and we always ought to view the other person's needs as more important than our own. So we have normative and descriptive theories mixed up here, and uh, now what we're going to do is look at Hume and I'm going to look at uh, Rousseau. And here's Hume. Okay. 
Um, and he has got to be the philosopher who's best known in this country for having denied the role of reason and ethics. In his treatise of human nature, uh, he makes this now famous statement that reason is the slave of the passions. So he says, reason is and ought only to be the slave of the passions and can never pretend to any other office than to serve and obey them. So somehow it's our feelings or passions that work together with our moral judgments rather than our reason. And exactly how radically we are supposed to understand this is a matter of interpretation among human scholars. Do moral judgments describe the feelings of whoever has judgments? Or are moral judgments identical with the feelings? And would be, a, be that as it may, Hume believes that our moral approach or uh, approval or disapproval can't come from reason, but originates in our feelings. So good and evil are a matter of emotional responses, not rational evaluations. And furthermore, and these feelings work, that work together with our moral judgments are not predominantly selfish, but they're a combination of self-interest and a strong element of sympathy or fellow feeling. This fundamental sympathy is the origin of our moral judgments and engages when we don't have any particular interest in the situation and our selfishness is not engaged. And psychologically, the moral feelings of sympathy will give us pleasure and are primarily extended to friends and other people close to us, but whether we extend them to strangers or to friends, these feelings of sympathy don't come from any selfish basis, says Hume. They originate in a kind of common point of view that em empathizes emphasizes what is good for society. Uh, in the later uh, inquiry concerning the principles of morals, he even calls it a feeling for the happiness of mankind and resentment of their misery. And of course, you can tell why Ben will pick up on that and uh, start working on utilitarianism. Now we go to Rousseau. Because in, in the continental tradition, where, which is my background, um, it's not Hume who's brought up as a champion of natural sympathy, empathy, or compassion. It's Jean-Jacques Rousseau. In his second essay, Discourse on the Origin of Inequality Among Men, from 1755, that's quite a while back, he speculates, and that's really all it is, speculation, that the original human attitude toward others in the state of nature is compassionate, not competitive. He even says that Hobbes was right, those of you who know Hobbes, uh, was right that humans engage in belligerent conduct to keep what's theirs, but that is not in the state of nature. That is in the first stages of civilization, down the long road to total corruption. In addition, Rousseau makes it very clear that he believes that it's the development of the rational capacity that we have to thank for our selfish behavior, our scheming, all our social ills, uh, and the whole problem of owning property. <laughs> he throws that one into the mix. Uh, so the closer you can get to your original emotional demeanor, the more superior you are morally. Uh, this, of course, also ties in with his view that anyone living in close proximity to nature has one up on people in the cities, morally speaking, which is where we get the term the noble savage and the entire cultural wave of the age of romanticism in the early 19th century. Um, by the time we get to Rousseau's social contract from 1762, he has developed his natural compassion theory into a social theory of grassroots democracy where the people are the sovereign and everyone, all males anyway, uh, they have to vote on all issues. And the assumption here is that as a citizen, you will want to put the community interest ahead of your self-interest, and thus dig deeper into that natural compassion of yours and generate the will of the people um, in favor of the common good, which he calls the general will. This, the trick about the general will, is that it is right by default. So if you find yourself in the minority, it must be that you only look after your own interests, which means you are wrong by default. Now, there isn't anyone in contemporary neurobiological research who jumps to such ex extreme conclusions. But what I find interesting is that Rousseau manages to build his entire political philosophy on the assumption of natural empathy. And if natural empathy has now been established as a scientific fact, where will that take us? So I will get to that in a few minutes. So now I want to do a Oh, it's a grand tour of the old debate about reason versus emotion. Because uh, there's only a handful of philosophers who over the years have suggested that human emotions, such as compassion, are either more original or more relevant than rational thinking. But the debate is familiar throughout Western cultural history. And uh, you know, my uh, primary uh, work is philosophy of literature. Um, but years ago, I also wrote a book about philosophy of myth. I want to extend this reason versus emotion dichotomy into a larger field of cultural symbolism because 
Aside from a brief sidebar, this area of romanticism, Western tradition has taught us invariably that reason trumps emotion. Now I'm wondering if we might be witnessing a fundamental shift in the entire system of these familiar metaphors. So this year, uh, this is going all the way back to Greek antiquity with the arrival in the time of Plato and Aristotle of the religion of Dionysus, challenging the prevailing worship of Apollo and Athena. And both those gods epitomized the light of reason. And Athena uh, is herself the brainchild of Zeus, right? popping out of his brain, no mother needed. Right? Um, Bacchus, or Dionysus, is of course the god of chaos, mystical visions, uncontrolled emotions. Euripides' tragedy, The Bacchus, tells this frightening story of how a young king tries to stem the tide of Dionysus' worship and ends up paying for his audacity with his life, killed by his mother, who is a Bacchus worship. Okay. Reason loses, emotion wins. But in the Western tradition, it has been reason which has been the winner, except in one way, gotta mention that. The Dionysus' worship was the beginning of the theater, and the tradition of, of emotion-based stories lives on and on in the movie industry. So now we uh, are going to look at some symbols, some more symbols of reason versus emotion. And this is, of course, uh, if you know uh, Raphael's painting, uh, 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 The School of Athens, we've got uh, Plato on the left there and Aristotle on the right. Uh, and Plato pointing out toward the eternal realm of the forms, the never changing ideas that give reality to our shadowy world, which the intellect can comprehend but not the senses. And Aristotle. He was not a sentimentalist because he praises reason almost as highly as Plato does. But his outstretched hand, I mean, this thing here, uh, shows us that he considers this world we live in as the true reality, not a cerebral realm beyond our senses. Uh, but this world, uh, in Aristotle's own terminology, is a world of matter. And that means that it is a less perfect part of our reality, the more perfect part is what shapes the matter and gives it its essence, the inherent form. And this again, is mean, again means that anything that is closer to our physical existence, rather to our intellectual life, such as our emotions, is lower in the hierarchy for Aristotle also. Here we have the symbol of heaven and earth, okay. A classical symbol of the battle between reason and emotion. Heaven symbolizing the light of reason. Of course, there's a platonic twist to that. Earth symbolizing the soulless matter of our physical existence. Uh, and that's, this symbology goes on all the way up through the Middle Ages. Uh, and with that symbolism comes this one, <laughs> soul and body, uh, where the soul is ethereal and immortal, the body, well, uh, earthly, earthy, uh, dangerous, uh, tempting, so forth, uh, depending on how we feel about that body. Um, this ties in, of course, with what some scholars today call somatophobia, fear of the body. At least the downgrading of the value of physical life and its needs and pleasures and the upgrading of cerebral uh, occupations. And some of you will recognize Nietzsche's critique of precisely this attitude here. Uh, so, and some scholars uh, lay this body-soul dichotomy at the feet of Descartes, but we can really trace it all the way back through Augustine and Plotinus to Plato. So here's uh, two more symbols. The traditional notion that humans represent reason, animals represent impre uh, the irrepressible drives and emotions. Of course, not just in terms of actual humans and animals, uh, but an entire normative philosophy advocating that we cultivate the human rational side uh, and shun, oppress, or simply ignore our animal nature. But when we look at that face, I mean, isn't that a face where there's something going on in the head? But then again, that's my own interest in the animal intelligence, but that's the traditional symbolism. Okay. And here, all right. uh, as a tribute to the new Star Trek movie, which I hear is uh, really uh, keeping all its promises, uh, for anyone who might still be a Trekker these days, these symbols ought to be instantly recognizable. Okay. How a cool reason over pop emotion. Here we have Spock, and there we have Bones. And in the uh, long lasting series and also the, um, the movies, we have the intermediate character, I don't want to put him in, but the intermediate character who comprises both, that would be Captain Kirk. Um, uh, so it's actually quite a traditional idea of uh, two symbols symbolizing 
the uh, split personality of the person in the middle. But here we have the reason as opposed to uh, an outdoor emotion. However, um, Spock is half human, half rational. I'm sorry, half, yeah, he's half human, which means half emotional, and he's half Vulcan, which means uh, he is half rational. And the lesson is taught over and over again in the Star Trek universe that you are incomplete without your emotional side. And that is actually on the way to this 21st century neurological finding that emotion is a birthright, uh, moral birthright even, of human beings. Okay, here is the last symbol that I have for you. And that may be the most telling and maybe also the most uh, problematic one. Uh, male and female, because to this day we struggle with the emotion that men are logical and women are intuitive. And even if it should turn out that women's brains have certain connections that allow us to make predominantly intuitive judgments, and males have a rational form of thought process, it doesn't preclude that men can be intuitive and women can be logical, of course. We know that these days. In this painting here, you can see how the symbolism plays out. Adam and Eve have just been kicked out of the garden. Both are feeling turmoil and dread. Even so, it's the woman in abject terror who's looking to the man for guidance. He's already looking ahead. Emotion needs reason, but reason has no need of emotion. Anyway, that's how I interpret this picture here. Uh, the list of symbols uh, or stereotypes depicting the supremacy of reason over emotion is, of course, not ending here. We could go on and on. But we'll leave, you, leave it here and just consider the changing times that not for the first time in history, but for the first time in a long time, the pendulum is swinging the other way, and the positive values of emotional engagement are being upgraded and maybe even reinstated. Okay. So now we're getting toward the end here, looking at what lies ahead for ethical theater. This is where we're going to face the future. Uh, if we can really be certain that emotions, and in particular the emotion of empathy, is a fundamental human trait, predating our rational capability. And our brain is fundamentally a social brain. Where do we go from here? I predict that some classical philosophical questions uh, may be put aside as irrelevant, maybe even false. Uh, the old epistemological problem of solipsism may finally be retired. Solipsism, which means solus ipse from Latin only I exist, it has been a thorn in the side of epistemologists trying to overcome the fact that when all is said and done, all we can be sure of is our own existence, not of whether it actually reflects the outside world. Because every time we think we have encountered the outside world, we have encountered it through our own experience. So at least theoretically, we would be in a grand illusion of the existence of the world made up by our own mind. Okay. Uh, which is very irritating. Descartes had this problem or at least he uh, played along with it as in, in his methodical doubt, but he also ended up with the real problem of uh, solipsism. And Bishop Barclay put it to good use, creating his idealistic philosophy. But if our brains have built-in systems by which we can understand the actions, thought, and particularly the feelings of other people, and our first emotional reactions are empathetic, unless we are sociopaths, uh, there is at least a good indicator that we are not the one in the world, because then those features would not make any sense. Other, of course, the solipses can keep going and going and claim that we also make up all the stories about we are neurons, etc., and you are hallucinating when you think you're watching me give this presentation. Oh, but that would put us at a level of what Descartes calls madness, thinking that our heads are boards and made out of glass or paint out of glass. Oh, we've got to draw the line someplace, I think, and just move on. Oh, so how about the end of psychological egoism? Oh, maybe we can now put it to rest, or maybe we can put it down. Uh, because some of us have wanted to take a blunt instrument to that theory for a long time. Uh, psychological egoism claims that everything any one of us does is for selfish reasons and it's humanly impossible to be unselfish. This dreadfully popular theory is the radicalization of philosophical and sociological theories that self-preservation is the foremost concern of human beings. But that is under the assumption that most, hu most basic human reactions are self-interested, self-serving, or downright selfish. And according to the neurobiological research, that just isn't the case across the board. <coughs> Some brains are indeed more self-oriented than others, but on the whole, it is apparently more normal to be perfectly capable of thinking about others' welfare for their sake, not because of what we get out of it. This may translates into a new emotion-based ethic, an ethical naturalism founded on the assumption that it is natural for us to care about others and unnatural not to. And we can essentially ground the whole notion of ethics in the intuitive fellow feeling that Hume was talking about. 
So non-naturalism would be meeting its challenge here uh, and would have to respond to the theory that our entire capacity for moral feelings is innate. Uh, this is where I would point out to some of the problems that might arise from this fantastic research. And don't get me wrong, I really think the research is fantastic. But you can't just let it go at that. As, as moral philosophers, we have to uh, you know, take second books. Uh, for some of us, this is, of course, the era, the era we've been waiting for. An almost Nietzschean transvaluation of values. With our common humanity as a center, not quite Nietzsche saw the extraordinary individual. Yet, I think we should move ahead slowly. There are a few pitfalls. Um, and one of them could be that we, we might be moving toward a new era of romanticism. Just like Rousseau's focus on emotions as a moral value helped catapult the West into the era of romanticism in the late 18th century, the new neurological findings have the potential of doing exactly the same thing. If they are picked up on by crossover psychologists, philosophers, artists, other cultural uh, popularizers, if you want to call it that, um, the original romanticism spawned some wonderful cultural happenings. We wouldn't want to be without them, right? But the extreme emphasis on the inherent goodness of emotions may make people forget, as they did then, that all emotion and no reason is as troublesome as all reason and no emotion. That means that if we end up downgrading the role of reason and downplaying the entire realm and history of moral rational decision making, we risk assuming that all emotional empathetic uh, reactions are good and appropriate in themselves, and somehow the calculations of the utilitarian are the product of a damaged brain. But common sense and experience tells us that's, of course, not the case. We already know from the <coughs> study that the test subjects who were willing to throw another person on the trolley tracks to save out others had a damaged ventromedial area. The implication, which Dimension does not draw, but others are already, already doing it, is that all utilitarians are brain damaged. Uh, maybe so also for uh, deontologists, but of course, Joshua Green thinks otherwise. He thinks that the deontologists are emotionalists. Uh, that one, I cannot really wrap my brain around. Uh, regardless of that, we can't rely on an instinct or empathy to give us the correct answer to a moral problem. Sometimes our reason must override our compassionate emotions and consider the consequences. If you had to take your child to the dentist, her tears should not move you to cancel the appointment because she's upset. It'll be detrimental to her later on. As much as you empathize. Oh, and of course you do. Poor baby. What are we going to do? Call up and say, oh no, you will never have to go to the dentist because uh, you're so upset. So your teeth will fall out. Uh, we're not going to do that. We're going to have to do what we have to do. Uh, perhaps we even have to override our extreme discomfort at sacrificing one person at the trolley stop so that five can survive or shoot down a plane with terrorists and civilian passengers because the uh, alternative is far worse, such as the plane striking the capital, which of course was the plane that was in place for Flight 93. And it would have happened if the crew, and, or not the crew, but if the passengers had not uh, rebelled <coughs> against the terrorists. Uh, so this is where Joshua Green's solution of the two brain systems in conflict may give us some insight. But, then again, Green's version assumes that one of the brain systems is warm and fuzzy. And, and of course, that also includes deontology, interestingly. And the other is cold and calculating. And I think that his own values play into that assessment, uh, anti-utilitarian. Uh, because, as we perhaps forget, sometimes the hard thing to do is the right thing to do. What we are most reluctant to do may be the truly moral solution, and Kant, of course, is the primary voice for that. Uh, and of course, the challenge would be to evaluate what, when that kind of action is warranted, and when it is an excuse for some kind of nefarious agenda. Instinct cannot tell us that. Only rational analysis can. Um, another problem uh, with the empathy theories is, is why so many people seem not to have that empathy. <laughs> um, from serial killers uh, to other criminals. And if include them, these aren't criminals, but these would be graduate students in Zimbardo Stanford prison experiment because they certainly override whatever empathy uh, they had um, when the situation calls for following orders. Apple Brighton comes to mind. Because without the tendency to override your empathy or not have it at all, um, does this mean that uh, um, uh, we would not have Hannah Arendt's concept of the banality of evil? 
Because as far as I can tell, the only solution coming from neurobiology is that these brains are somehow not normal. That's not enough for a moral philosopher. And in court, they can be convicted because they will not be legally insane. In fairness to Steven Pinker, whom I mentioned in the beginning, not everyone engaged in neurobiology or evolutionary research see eye to eye on the primacy of emotion uh, and empathy. Pinker believes that Hobbes was right. Not Rousseau. We really are suffering by nature. The evolution of human violent nature um, uh, proves it, uh, which is kind of a throwback to theories of human nature in the early to mid 20th century. Um, but this is really where we get the legal implication here. Uh, there are already predictions that this research will have an impl impact on our legal system because if empathy is the normal default, then should we treat criminals who display less or no empathy as not criminals but mental patients? Does that mean we will be able to predict their non empathetic behavior and lock them up before they act? It may have an imp impact, impact on the entire concept of criminal responsibility, just like we saw with the debate about heart determinism in the early 20th century. It may have an impact on the ongoing uh, discussion about the, the uh, free will and moral responsibility. And that's why Patricia Churchland makes a point of saying that being able to map our consciousness does not preclude the experience of a free will. We just have to reinterpret it as a neurologically based self-control mechanism. And Dan Dennett is a primary voice these days for what we call compatibilism, a combination of the free will and predictable causality. And if we're headed into a new era of idealizing our emotional and compassionate nature, the step is very short to passing judgment on expressions of self-interest and creating an environment where any self-interest, rational or otherwise, becomes pathologized. I don't know if that word exists. I think I made it up. But meaning that you make something sick, that you classify it as being sick. <laughs> I don't know if it exists. Um, this would mean marginalizing anyone or any group who believes it is legitimate to pursue their own happiness, even if it is done in a way that's not just committed to others. So the whole pursuit of happiness might be kind of, kind of uh, pathologized. Uh, and we need to watch out for making self-interest into a new villain, a sign of sickness that needs to be cured. This is not what neurobiology teaches us. It could lead to even a possible political fallout uh, if we upgrade uh, empathy and emotion that way, which could be a political and moral witch hunt, with so style on politicians and voters who want to have personal interests protected. Because this would mean that if you pursue your self-interest as a citizen, you are by definition anti-social. Uh, we may have an initial leaning toward empathy for others. It doesn't mean that we are somehow abnormal if we are also capable of looking after ourselves. Any theory that tends to uh, marginalize any kind of self-interest, I think, would be doomed, just like Rousseau's theory of the general rule. Um, and this illustration, it comes from a story that some of you know, uh, Plato's Symposium. This depicts Aristophanes' story of the original male and female before they evoke the jealousy of the gods who split them down the middle to make them less powerful. And, of course, Aristophanes says we've been uh, looking for our missing half ever since. You've got to remember that Aristophanes was a comedy writer. He was probably not serious. A lot of people are taking this very, very serious. It's probably not intended uh, as anything but a, uh, a little joke there. Uh, but my point is that when, and the point of the story is that when we were two sides of the same being, we were invincible. So I will suggest that in the same way the roles played by reason and emotion in ethics are not only mutually exclusive, they are interdependent. Without emotion, we have no engagement. Without reason, we have no direction. So in the end, I'll have to say the final word in moral theory cannot come from neuroscience. Maybe that means that I am a non-naturalist in the end. Neuroscience can only tell us that we have empathy. It can only be descriptive. Neuroscience uh, can't tell us whether the empathy is appropriate or misdirected. That remains a job of a moral judgment based on a rational evaluation, a normative undertaking. That doesn't mean that neuroscience is irrelevant either. We are not minds in a vacuum disconnected to our brains and to the research done to those brains. We are physical beings in a physical universe. That's what Damasio says. He channels Spinoza in that respect. If neurobiologists can tell us that we have mirror neurons, brainwave and say, natural form of empathy, then there may really be philosophical questions we can leave on the shelf from now on and only visit them when we need a history of question. So neurobiology has brought us a lot closer to understanding ourselves as the social animal Aristotle said we were. But we still need more theories about the appropriateness of empathy and we need more rational deliberation, not just a checklist of empathy. 
because sometimes our reaction is not going to be in, in, uh, immediate. It is going to be over time. We need to be able to do that. And even Patricia Churchill clearly states that just knowing that we have natural moral tendencies that can be explained as brain function doesn't mean we need not analyze them and make moral choices based on our scale of values. So this is where I'll conclude with evoking what I know a little bit about, our capacity for storytelling. Because the storytelling capacity is clearly a brain phenomenon. It belongs to the brain hemisphere. We can confabulate. Now it's over here. We make up stories to present plausible explanations to get a grip on chaotic reality, like I said before. But it's also perhaps the deepest moral enterprise that we can embark on, like the novelist Ursula Le Guin calls it. She calls it telling the world. You create a meaning and a moral universe through a story of not only right and wrong, but the entire system of justification for doing the right thing and being a good person. Neurobiology will be able to tell us how we tell stories, perhaps even why, but it can't tell us whether the stories are good and whether the moral of the story is good. We need human engagement and philosophical rational evaluation to make such a judgment. So we have reached the end. And I have to throw this one in just because we've been talking about heaven and earth. And otherwise, I don't know if it's relevant. But I will leave this up. And then uh, we can move on to talking about the uh, questions and answers. If you like. uh, I have a question about your belief on the mirror neuron theory. Yes. Oh, it's it's. Uh, I will have to have a belief based on something that uh, I could know more about. Yeah. It's uh, just so, it's basically. Uh, just yeah. Uh, so that means that uh, I may go back on that uh, six months from now if I learn more. Um, in terms of morality, I think it has tremendous problems. I think we can actually understand, uh, it, it may even go further than, than uh, you know, what I depicted here. I think there's a potential for even some explanations that look like they were paranormal, which actually may turn out to be uh, physical, which a lot of us who are fascinated by that realm that philosophers aren't supposed to go, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, thought transfer and all that stuff. Um, and we've said, well, if there is a human general consensus in all cultures that we have these experiences, maybe we should not completely throw them out and say they don't exist, because that could be begging the question. We might assume that they don't exist, but that's what we're supposed to prove. Uh, so maybe this can explain it. Why we have some ideas at the same time. Why do twins think of the same thing at the same time? Why do really good friends call each other at the same time on the phone? So it might not even involve looking at each other. I think it holds promise, but I also think that we should not go off the deep end and think that we are uh, linked like ants in an ant colony uh, where everybody knows uh, because of chemical reactions what the others are doing, which apparently they do. So it, I'm, I'm more positive myself than what I dared to float in the paper. But I am perfectly willing to change my mind <laughs> if, if it turns out, if it, if it falls flat. Yes? Um, the evidence for the existence of an operation of neural neurons is increasing fairly steadily. Uh, they're located in the sensory uh, cortical zones because they respond to certain types of sensory input, facial expressions, you know, and other forms of behavior by, by humans. Um, but while they're located in the brain sensory cortical zones, they have a rich network of connections you know, to the motor cortex, to the frontal lobes, to the limbic system, you know, which is responsible for emotional responses and, and other uh, more mammalian you know, uh, involuntary uh, responses. And the connections to the motor cortex are especially interesting because this is apparently the basis for the oh, roughly third of a second or so of physical mimicry uh, when we see somebody else smiling and we have uh, an empathic uh, response to it via these mirror, mirror neurons and that's through their connections with the limbic system and the, and the frontal lobe but then the connections to the motor cortex result in a very brief roughly one-third of a second re, uh, very attenuated mimicry you know of that say smile that we're observing in other words we have a very abbreviated muscle action of producing a smile, but it's very, very abbreviated. And this is the case for the perception and comprehension of all uh, emotion-related facial expressions. Uh, another aspect of the oh, no, nervous system. Let, let, let me just uh, ask you this, because uh, I mean, this, <laughs> yeah, uh, this is wonderful. We get some, some uh, you know, fresh uh, input. Um, 
it can be overridden by our will, whatever our will is? Yes, yes. Well, it can be a hit, it's true. Yes. The frontal, yes. the frontal uh, lobes, you'll know, have a you know, large number of fiber tracts called descending fiber tracts, you know, that provide for, you know, voluntary attentional focus, you know, uh, voluntary emotional control, and, and similarly with, you know, the action of these mirror neurons. Uh, but here's another interesting finding that's quite recent. Uh, another part of the nervous system uh, that is in, involved in what we might call some of the, you know, the, the neurobiological bases for moral behavior uh, is the vagus nerve, which is part of the parasympathetic uh, nervous system. Uh, and it uh, normally functions you know, to uh, calm the heart down, you know, lower heartbeat, uh, 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 sends signals to a lot of organs, especially in the chest area. Uh, and so when the vagus nerve is, is active, we experience a, a, a calming effect uh, and, and a warmth, a pleasant warmth. Uh, especially you know, in, in the main trunk area of our bodies. And recent research has found that individuals who have a, a higher average uh, uh, baseline level of activity in, in their vagus nerves uh, tend to be more compassionate and more generous. This has even been found now in children. Children with a higher uh, baseline uh, va uh, vagal activity you know, are, are more, excuse me, more cooperative and more generous than children who have a lower baseline activity level in their vagus nerves. So there apparently are a number of systems, interacting systems in the brain that provide us as a social species with this initial capacity for empathy and, and fairness. And then of course all that gets modulated by experience, upbringing, culture, you know, the individual's developing capacity for reason. And there of course we want to avoid a false dichotomy between emotions and reason and morality. Um, for one thing, I have heard about the, uh, the research into children's uh, capacity for empathy, uh, which of most of us, we have, uh, philosophically, we have grown up buying into the idea that children are little selfishness machines. Uh, and uh, this is where, uh, so, uh, uh, phylogeny, mirrors, uh, ontogeny, that uh, you know, as little children are so, are we, we are fundamentally, uh, you know, um, focused on selfishness. And it's such, it's a surprise to a lot of people who don't know kids that kids, a lot of kids are not very selfishly oriented. They will actually try to, you know, mommy is crying and the little kid will, will try to comfort mommy because uh, you know, maybe it's because, oh, I feel your pain, it, it hurts. Or maybe just, well, you don't want people to be upset. Um, so uh, this, some kind of original compassion reaction uh, seems to be there, so there's actual neurological reasoning or research to, to bear that out. Well, just like um, with children, we shouldn't di dichotomize the issue. You know, children have both the capacity or the tendency towards selfish behavior, but also a natural neurobiologically based empathic ability. Again, it's all modulated by experience, and unfortunately, some of them lose that empathic ability you know, through uh, you know, childhood abuse and so forth, and they grew up cold hearted individuals. But, uh, and apparently, this starts very, very early. And one of the things that I read was that. The, it is uh, the mirror neuron system that uh, produces the effect of well, a, a baby, a six-month-old baby. You can uh, reach out your tongue at her, and she'll do the same thing uh, without any kind of, maybe even earlier than that. So, and I've heard that same is the case for monkeys, and that really uh, will send your head spinning because that means that there are a whole bunch of our categories that have to be redefined. Yeah. Just to uh, pick up on Michael's point about the false dichotomy between reason and emotion. And I just think it's interesting that throughout the history of philosophy in particular, um, uh, and also this kind of uh, uh, traditional battle between art and science, or you know, the heart and the head, uh, how yet uh, philosophers in particular have made a lot, of, uh, uh, a lot of that and have tried to really use and, and kind of, um, you know, what perhaps is just a uh, a, a, an outcome of, of language and concepts making two distinct categories of just a singular kind of, uh, you know, differential human trait. And so I'd be interested to hear what you have to say about why, why has this dichotomy been emphasized or how has this dichotomy been used for perhaps, you know, gaining of power or I'm thinking particularly of men controlling the world over women categorizing them as emotional, as, as harmful, dangerous, chaotic. Um, how have we, you know, what, what's the basis for, for making this distinction? Is what, it a power grab what, or? What, what, what happened? What, what brought that whole thing into being? I can think of one direction at least, and then I, I'm just 
thinking of a whole bunch of other things that we could say. Uh, for one thing, in this current research, I would go to Ramachandran for that, and I would, would look at his writings without thereby uh, you know, wanting him to comment on philosophy. But he has research about the, um, the connections between uh, sounds and concepts. So certain types of sounds will uh, bring forth certain ideas in our brain, such as a sharp sound will, and real, really basic, a sharp sound will associate to a sharp thing and a round sound will associate to a round thing. And he has a, a wonderful example of, let's see if I can remember it, um, Bulu and Kiki. Okay, so uh, in, in his research, he has, uh, I mean, he, he presents these, these questions and test subjects, and then he draws on the board and uh, says, uh, okay, uh, here's, here's a shape for you like this, okay. And here's a shape for you like this, okay. And he says, which one is Bulu and which one is Kiki? Everybody in the audience says, oh, that, that's, that's obviously Kiki, that's Bulu. There is no language base for that because the words don't mean anything. But everybody seems to latch onto that. And this is where I'm thinking that if we get a sense that these sharp edges are the effective edges, this is where we get things done, and the round stuff is uh, warm and fuzzy and so forth, there will be a downplay of the, uh, you know, the whole realm of something that can be associated with the uh, you know, warm and fuzzy stuff and with the uh, you know, uh, goal-oriented, rational uh, ideas. So it could be a, simply a psychological um, predisposition. But, so that's one thing, it's just off the top of my head, but one that I know of where we can actually trace it back, that was what I was getting at a little bit, that um, when I mentioned somatophobia, that in uh, the history of philosophy, which also, of course, becomes the history of uh, gender, uh, the history of uh, power, uh, do so many other things. Um, very often, Descartes is pointed out as the one person uh, with whom the overemphasis on technology resides in the Western tradition. Because we are thinking things, we are not feeling things. Not that Descartes necessarily um, wanted to propel us into a technology-oriented culture, but very often that is taken to be the, the beginning point. This is where we take, okay, this, this is the start, where we downplay anything that has to do with the body and we play up anything that has to do with the mind. And that, of course, would, uh, that would have the, uh, we could compare with other cultures that have not had that uh, you know, mind-body dichotomy where also, I mean, there's gender <coughs> issues there too, but it may come from, from other reasons. But uh, the, the overwhelming emphasis on the power of rationality combined with the notion of the power of technology sends us in that direction. And that, of course, will also be combined with the, well, who are the ones who are out there in society thinking rationally and doing technology? They're the ones who are not in the home doing the baby thing. So some political um, practicalities are probably in there. But in terms of the conceptual dawn of this, a lot of people say Descartes. I would actually take it back to Plato, because uh, you have that, that same configuration. So th those are two possibilities. I could imagine more, but those are two. Uh, yes? Uh, I, I was noting after, after this discussion that the research is popping out all over the place. I, about a half a year ago, I was at a conference up here with Ramachandran and uh, Pat Churchill, okay. and uh, the, uh, present, one of the presenters uh, indicated that there was uh, serious research indicating that a, um, I think a neurotransmitter, uh, oxytocin. Uh, oxytocin. 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 Okay. Yes. Uh, close. <laughs> um, is now implicated in uh, empathy, and uh, you know the levels of that uh, indicate you know how much and. So yeah, that, that tends to indicate that it may be, you know, uh, moving toward naturalism. Um, although personally, I would I would stick with the notions of Lubake and with Nietzsche, that even if that's so, it just means that one has no primacy over the other; that we're just dual beings. Um, here, uh, th and there is something about uh, certainly uh, Patricia Churchland and uh, you know a, a lot of other thinkers who have been working on these things for years are known philosophically as eliminated materialists. 
uh, which means that uh, not only are they materialists in the sense that, not, not in the financial sense, but in the philosophical sense, that they think that uh, the, the true reality is a world of the body, or matter rather than uh, the world of the mind. And uh, you know, uh, an eliminated materialist, I, I, I try to uh, discern whether it's just a rumor that, that she actually is, or whether she really, really is. Because she could be a reductive materialist, but she could also be an eliminated materialist. The reductive materialist, and, and uh, my, you know, I'm an ethicist at heart, so uh, but sometimes I have to dabble in, in these other things. Um, the reductive materialist says, well, sooner or later, we will be able to explain everything about human behavior as a matter of brain uh, functions. Uh, we will still be able to use the term mind, but we should understand that this is simply a metaphor for when we talk about brain reactions. The eliminated materialist wants to do away with the concept of mind. They say, okay, uh, um, I do believe that, that uh, Skinner, the psychologist, uh, wanted to do that, Watson also, wanted simply to not talk about mind, want to talk about brain reactions exclusively. And if we want to talk about a brain chemical that makes us feel warm and fuzzy and understand others and so forth, um, I would hate to think that that would mean that if we can refer everything back to the brain chemical, then we are somehow satisfied saying, oh, is that what it is? Well, cool. Uh, now we don't have to ask any more questions because it's not going to mirror the human experience. That's why I've, I've always been <laughs> more in the dualist direction. But that's, of course, dangerous these days because that's so problematic. Um, and that's why and I actually had a, uh, a second to last page of Spinoza, but I cut it because I realized that we were running out of time. Oh, because Spinoza, that's also why Damasio likes Spinoza so much. Spinoza says, oh, we can keep talking. All those years ago, we're talking the same time as Descartes. Oh, Spinoza says, we can absolutely keep talking about mind. And we should talk about body, but they really are two sides of the same phenomenon. They're just two different ways of explaining it. So that would mean that a uh, brain chemical like that, if we don't retain a sense of, well, that means that we feel like we uh, you know, are in touch with others and so forth. Uh, then we have lost something that's very important. We can't just say that well, once we have the chemical explanation of it, then we understand it all. Because maybe the professionals do, but the rest of us really don't. Uh, but I will pursue that because I think I know that th that particular chemical uh, appears in the brain when we feel really, really warm and fuzzy about other people, uh, and, and that would uh, maybe I know that from, from other from psychologists uh, working in, in that area. So that would bear that. Out. Okay. Uh, I don't know who's next. Yes. Um, so, I remember my, my first philosophy class, um, there, they, there was a study, I can't remember who did it, but uh, it was like the, the man who was in a cave and he saw, all he was able to see was shadows of animals that walked by. Um, and then, you know, would he recognize those animals from their shadows? So, and you know, I've only really heard about that in you know, the philosophical sense. Um, does, I mean, would, would he just innately be, a, be able to biologically, you know, recognize those Well, that of course, so I've got to uh, take this back to the source, because the story that you're talking about, as, as a lot of us recognize, is Plato's an, uh, uh, Allegory of the Cave. And uh, here they are sitting in the cave, um, uh, ch shackled, chained to their little benches, and they can only look in one direction, and on that, of uh, course, <laughs> Uh, that screen of the wall uh, is projected, what they think is reality, but it's just cut out uh, in front of a fire in the background. Okay, so yeah, they think they've always been there, so they think that that is, uh, uh, that is the true depiction of reality. So one person is able to uh, you know, get rid of uh, his shackles and for one thing turn around and see that there's a fire and they're being manipulated uh, their shadows, and that he thinks that, or they think that these are the correct, uh, you know, depictions of reality. But for, but the next step is, of course, he gets out of the cave, and he is blinded by the sunlight, which means that at first he can't see anything. So the answer would be here. At first, no. Uh, if we, if we take that to be an analogy of what we talk about, which I don't really know if it works, but if we, if we try that. Um, he gets out of the cave immediately, and uh, seeing true reality is not going to make any sense to him because it's not going to compare to what he's used to. But after a while, his eyes adjust and he will be able to discern trees and mountains and the ocean far away and whatever else it is that we do, we mm -hmm. philosophy professors, when we make that drawing on the board. 
and uh, you know some of us are more elaborate than others, and uh, you know all this this fantastic rea colorful reality that he sees uh, uh, compared to that dull these dull dark shadows on the wall. Uh, so according to Plato, after a while, yes, you will get used to uh, true reality, which of course, unfortunately for our analogy here, is not of this world. So uh, reeling it back to your question, if what we have been used to so far are uh, illusions, illusions about how things really are. Will we recognize them when we hear what really matters? Now, I don't know because it depends on the skill of the person who explains it. If we hear nothing but oh, you know, neurological explanations with, with chemistry, I don't think we're going to recognize it. And it doesn't depend on how long we stay in that environment, or maybe it does. If we take new PhDs in that area, then we say, okay, now we understand the chemical stuff. But it still has to appeal to our ordinary language and ordinary um, explanation of things. So I would say that um, there's a problem there if we, um, if we go beyond the basic explanations to try to understand what they really are talking about without there being some kind of interpreter. And then we get the problem of non-scientist interpreters who simplify things too much, like inventing, oh, the mind was found in the moral center of the brain. Oh, but that really wasn't what he invented because it was the science writer who came up with that. And uh, you know, we, uh, I do have to make, I do have to plug our uh, beloved blog, philosophyonthemesa.com, where uh, you know some of uh, us philosophy professors here in Mesa are blogging. And Dwight put something in recently. My esteemed colleague Dwight Furrow put something in recently, precisely about that phenomenon. Um, so uh, I don't know if. if uh, did you want to say something, or was that about something else you wanted to say? Oh, it was about something else. Okay, that's fine. Well, related, but yeah. I, I think what you know, your presentation points out, what this discussion points out, is that phenomenology is still very really important. Um, because I think that our most basic sense of responsibility towards someone is clearly not a deduction from some principle of reason. But it's not necessarily emotional either. It can be, and if emotions help. Uh, but our sense of responsibility towards others is neither rational nor emotional. It's just simply a structural element of our experience. Uh, and the only way you can get at it is to describe that experience. Uh, I don't think it's reducible. I doubt. I guess we'll know in 100 years or so. <laughs> I doubt that it's fully reducible to um, you know, brain chemistry. Um, if we are to have a social uh, responsibility toward others, and a lot of philosophers have actually said this in, in a number of different ways, and also who have not been interested in the subject, but we can't rely on our emotions to give us that sense of social responsibility. What if we don't like those people? Uh, then they're excluded. We're only going to feel socially responsible for those we like. And then we're talking about discrimination. Right? So we can't have empathy as the basic uh, right. source of our uh, we can perhaps we can talk about social feelings, but they can't be uh, strong emotions. They can be some. Maybe this is Hume's common view uh, that he's talking about. That is not specifically a uh, uh, a strong feeling, but just an abstraction of what other people would respond to. And we're kind of back to the golden rule in a way. Um, yeah. So, uh, and I did not mention phenomenology because uh, I had to cut it some well, place. Well, yeah. you Yes. Levinas doesn't really belong in the uh, Rousseauian Hume that category. He's yeah. a phenomenologist, yeah. and that's really what he's trying to get at here: is that this is a structural element yeah. in our experience. Yeah. It's not reducible to either reason or emotion. Uh, yes. Sir. I kind of move then to the point where it's not going to be able to reduce to one thing or to an idea, but I think it's just because it's more complex than our mind could put together at one point in time. So basically, we will eventually be able to take all the pieces of puzzle of the puzzle and see them. I just don't think we'll be able to put them together and you know understand exactly what's going on, all the millions and millions of reactions that are going on at the same time. Yeah, um, it could very well be. I mean, this is kind of a, a scary thought, but our brains make it more complex than our brains can understand. <laughs> uh, and, uh, uh, what they've said about the universe. Isn't it wonderful that the universe is understandable? 
uh, which you know, yields uh, another whole slew of, of interesting theories. But who, <laughs> okay, that again is a kind of circular definition because what is it we see in the universe? Well, it's what we can understand and the rest of it we probably don't notice. Uh, so if we think that we understand the brain, maybe it's because we see whatever we are capable of understanding. Um, so what if we could enhance the brain to understand more? And that is what, that's what they're working on now. All these drugs that will uh, you know, enhance the brain, and right now we're thinking of the messy legal drugs or um, uh, the exam you know, drugs on the week of the final uh, and so forth. But if we may be getting into um, a genetic engineering, which is also something that has moral configuration, um, enhancing brains of people whose parents could afford it. Right? Um, and uh, then we might, now we may see through a blast darkly, but then we will understand things more clearly and we don't even have to die before we do that. Uh, yes? I'd, I'd like to just uh, emphasize uh, that we must always remember that the mind is a function of the brain you know, as part of an integrated system. The brain's integrated with the body, the body's in, uh, and the brain are integrated with the community, the community is integrated with the broader culture and society, and that's Isn't integrated, that? that's ingra integrated <laughs> with the whole biosphere. <laughs> you know, and they're, and they're, again, you know, they're just, they're just, we have to resist this tendency you know, to you know, over-categorize things, you know, you know, be it eliminative materialism or reductionism and so forth. You know, I mean, ultimately, mental functions are neurophysiologically <coughs> implemented in the brain, but to understand our mental life, we have to put it in a, the context of the body, the context of the community, the context of the uh, society and the culture, the context of the whole friggin' biosphere. And that's really the only way to understand it, because we're dealing with you know, uh, systems embedded within systems okay. and, and that, that interact. This, that is, that is so important, because of course what we have had up until now, and in other sciences are finding the same thing. That people have been sitting there with, on their, with their own little discipline. And even within that discipline, they have made you know, myriads of, of categories. Because even, even a small area is very complex. Um, and it's, it, you know, it appears that the further down you go, the, the narrow it gets, the more complex it gets. So it's one of those uh, science uh -huh, experiences. Mm -hmm. um, but that's why I was talking about scholars feeling like they're traitors if they cross over to other disciplines. Because that, isn't there enough for you here? Why do you need to go to other places? And those people don't know what we're talking about here anyway. But the more we cross over, we realize that there are categories that we can use. And of course, it is dangerous because it gets very, very complex, very fuzzy, uh, combining all, the, all these things. But how else are we going to understand our uh, neurology, our uh, history, our, our art forms, our uh, gender issues, uh, you know, everything, uh, all the way up to the, the galaxies. Uh, how are we going to understand it unless we combine with each other? Of course, there's some com companies that are more relevant than others. Uh, but this is, I mean, uh, think, of, think of the business of, uh, of archaeology these days. They're experiencing exactly the same thing. Philosophers don't have a whole lot to do with that. But archaeologists are no place without historians these days. And they are no place without biologists. Uh, and because, you, and, and uh, you know, uh, um, geologists. And chemists. And chemists, absolutely. Um, oh, uh, one, one of our good colleagues and uh, you know, friends, um, and of course, what's her name? <laughs> Madeline Hinkes, uh, who teaches in, in uh, anthropology, or physical anthropology. Uh, she will tell you that physical anthropology is no longer just about measuring bones and measuring heads and so forth. You have to, in order to identify bodies found in the desert who's been lying around there for weeks, you have to uh, uh, get the help of entomologists, uh, insect experts who can tell you how long the maggots in the body have been there and when they started and when they left and so forth. So all these different fields are finding the need to combine with other fields. And I think this is just this one of the examples. Uh, I don't have any high hopes for a unified theory of everything. Uh, life, the universe, everything, Douglas Adams. Uh, but uh, you know, the, the, the danger is, of course, that we spread ourselves out too far. And uh, we become dilettantes. And uh, this is a bit dilettantic, I know that, because uh, you know, certain things that I'm just floating to, oh, this is what I found on the internet, isn't that cool? Uh, but I think it's a start that some of us reach out to other fields. And when I was at the conference um, in, um, uh, I was at a conference, I should say, because a lot of you don't know that. 
I was at a conference uh, in Sun Valley a couple of years ago between philosophers and, or among, I wouldn't even say philosophers, and uh, literature experts, and the, the common topic was John Steinbeck. And it was amazing to see how well we got along, you know, can't we all uh, get along kind of thing, can't we all agree on things? Because, uh, the, and we all came with the same stories. Uh, no, generally, traditionally, our discipline frowns on you guys. We don't want to talk to you guys. Um, and here we were finding common ground uh, with our self-esteem and our discipline intact. We didn't have to give up on anything. We could just provide some knowledge that the other people needed. And I think that if we're cautious, we can do the same thing here. Philosophers really can contribute to the neurological or neurobiological debate. Uh, and of course, we're seeing these people getting dual degrees, which shows that they, they have a faith in, in that system. Um, so this is just starting. I mean, this is 21st century stuff. From the brain research that I know, the amazing thing is that uh, we don't just have ideas flowing in the brain. They actually leave some kind of a material footprint. Uh, such as, if we have, if we think a lot about something, and here I am, really, really dilettante, so pardon me if I've completely botched this, uh, but uh, from, from a moral point of view, I think if this is true, then we can really learn from it. Uh, if you have thoughts that you keep going over and over again, there is actually, between the neurons in your brain, is a connectivity made so that those neurons are actually linked physically with paths. And the more you think about it, the, the bigger that path is, which apparently, and again, correct me if this is completely, uh, you know, a story that I'm telling. Um, that means that those people who have obsessive compulsive disorders may actually have a brain path between one thought and another thought in the brain that scoots them down like a, uh, like down the chimney toward start talking about thinking about this, and a second later you're thinking about suicide, or a second later you're thinking about you worry about your mom, or a second later you're worrying about uh, do I have spinach between my teeth, or something. So uh, these kind of reactions are brain footprints of the thoughts. And then of course it's chicken and egg, which came first? Is it the brain imprint, imprint or is it the thought? And but I would like to think that it's the thought that makes the imprint, because otherwise we... Hardwired uh, after birth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so and that means there's not much that we can do. So if it is the case that people learn in a culture to think <coughs> in certain terms, it may configure the brain. Not so much that they have, you know, normal brains, but it's just another way of minute connections that are created in the brain. And that, I guess, would also mean that when we change our mind about something, maybe it's really changing our brain about something, that uh, the configuration slightly changed. And I mean, I know this from a uh, neurologist, Michael Gorian, who is considered a self-help expert, so he does not rate very highly among uh, uh, psychoanalysts. Even so, he says very, very interesting things. Uh, Michael Gorian talks about how male brains are configured in a certain way, female brains are configured in a certain other way, and he says that there are bridge brains, which allows a lot of us to, uh, you know, for women to be, uh, you know, very uh, kiki-ish, <laughs> and for men to be very blue-ish. Uh, so he doesn't use those terms, but now you know what I mean. Right? Um, and it also means that if we have, and he's the one who comes up with the. Uh, uh, Oxycontin? No, that wasn't it. Um, Oxytocin. Oxytocin. Whatever it is. Oxytocin. 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 Uh, Oxytocin. Oxytocin. No, not the drug, that, the, not the drug that people take, but, but the, the brain chemicals. Because um, he says, if you have a thought that you just, every time you end up with in, in quarrels in the home, uh, somebody does the one little thing that, uh, you know, all of us starts a major argument. He goes, I told you that, uh, you know, this is really, really wrong. Can't you just stop doing whatever it is? So we're on the same path over and over again with the same quarrels and the same slamming of the doors and so forth. And Florian says, okay, this is because you think of this and then automatically think of that. Uh, and it just it goes down that sheet the same way. Uh, try to think of something else. Okay, you have this, this, uh, oh my goodness, I'm angry. This, this leads to this and this and this. At this point in time, stop. Think of something else. I would say, uh, think, some psychology would say, think of your happy place. Uh, you know, I would not go there because uh, you know, that's really, really <laughs> non-productive. Uh, but uh, deflect it. Think of uh, you know, 
oh, okay, how can I now do like this, think of something else? And apparently what happens is, in your brain, this highway of association will start to crumble, just like in that Discover Channel series of what will happen when humans disappear from the planet. Oh, the highways start crumbling. So we can change our mind by changing the brain connections. So that, of course, means that we can learn to think in different ways. Uh, and it, apparently it is, there is a brain connection. Uh, so again, that about depletes my knowledge of the brain, so, which is not very much. Uh, but that, of course, means that we cannot claim that morally people are stuck in the same place. Uh, because uh, you know, we can learn to think differently. We can learn to do things from a different angle. And of course, some of us do that. All of a sudden, we have uh, the first, uh, first Husserl and the second Husserl. Uh, the first Wittgenstein and then the second Wittgenstein. Uh, they changed their minds. Uh, <laughs> I gotta say, uh, how are we doing for time? Okay, I gotta tell you that uh, there, I read a study a couple of years ago where a woman who had been um, a liberal all her life, uh, all of a sudden switched and became, she became conservative. And uh, with, with everything that goes with it, with uh, you know, viewpoints, moral viewpoints, political viewpoints, and so on and so forth. And uh, a psychologist, or psychoanalyst, whatever he was, he chimed, uh, chimed in and said, well, we should look for a brain tumor. And I, I, I thought it was so funny. Before, I think, yeah, it could happen. But can't people change their mind without uh, others assuming that you know, we're talking about sick brains? Because the same thing could happen, of course. And I know a lot of people like that. They start out with a childhood background of being conservative, and then something happens in their life, and now they're liberal. Are they then brain damaged? Or is it just because we're predisposition to think that liberalism is normal and conservatism is weird? Uh, so we think that conservatism is a brain tumor? No, it could be exactly the other way around. So we should be a lot more understanding of people legitimately changing their minds. <laughs> and maybe also their brain in the process. Yeah. One underlying thing here that seems to cause me trouble is that there's a un recognized dance between the indescriptive and prescriptive here. You know, and in masking things in descriptive senses, we ally our fears and troubles uh, the, uh, about the way we'd like things to be. And uh, we might wish things to be lots of ways, but that, that has no effect on this kind of stuff. And, uh, you know, we might like thinking Rousseau is sympathetic, but he gave away his five children, and anyone who knew him hated his guts because he was an unsympathetic guy. Yes. Yes. And the yeah. only guys who really liked him was Robespierre and Saint Just, and yeah. you know, people who like cutting people's heads off. Exactly. And let's let's <laughs> not forget that if Rousseau had lived longer, he would also have had his head cut off. Right? Yeah. No doubt yeah. about that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, so you know, even if it can be proved that people are in uh, sympathetic or whatnot, it still doesn't make it right. Because we've got a naturalistic fallacy floating around here. Um, you might like it, it might be comfortable for you, but phenomenologically, you look over the world, there's lots of people who aren't this way. Yeah. And we have to explain that somehow. And is it their choice? Or is it uh, you know, their brain configuration? Uh, and in the end, and this is also why I mentioned that uh, Josh Green saying that geontology belongs over on the side of uh, of uh, emotion, uh, yeah. that that your sense of duty is an emotional reaction. I mean, I know somebody who's spinning in his grave right now, uh, <laughs> hearing that. And um, of course, you could be right in some ways, but uh, you need a whole lot more argumentation. And it still boils down to, I think, that he thinks that having an emotional uh, basis is nice and right and yeah, proper. Yeah. And he probably likes Kant better than he likes Kant. But this is mindful of something Austin said in a slightly different context, but it applies here. There's a lot of people using, dreaming up bad reasons for things they believe on instinct. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. And, uh, and then when you have that self-fulfilling prophecy you know, come through, then you feel like you've discovered something. Yeah. It's yeah. wish fulfillment. I gotta say that from what I've read about this, uh, these new naturalists, such as uh, Pat Churchland, uh, has emphasized that we're not talking about the kind of naturalism that does not ask the normative question. 
because they think that they can be allowed to ask normative questions within naturalism. And if that's the case, well, we're just looking at a, a, a new animal, or maybe we're just reinterpreting what naturalism has been like all along. Um, but uh, it, it is true that we can't just say, oh, this is what they say we do. Does this mean this is what we ought to do? Peter Singer has been all over the internet arguing that. So uh, I think that's a, a good point. Yes? Wouldn't it be utterly bizarre to try to develop a moral theory that had nothing to do with human psychology? Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, the naturalistic yeah. fallacy is, you know, there's a point to it, but it's got to be handled with some yeah. care. Where else, because where else would we get the idea that this is something that is reasonable? Is because it happens already, so we determine whether it's right or wrong. And of course, the naturalistic fallacy is really <coughs> only for, uh, I, mean, I assume that everybody knows what the natural, naturalistic fallacy is, the assumption that we, uh, if we make the assumption that we can go from a fact to a moral rule about the fact or a policy based on the fact, then says a lot of philosophers, say a lot of philosophers, we are committing the naturalistic fallacy. We can't go from an is to an all. Um, sometimes, of course, we do that. Uh, and, uh, and the assumption is that, well, at least we should be able to point out where the moral evaluation comes into the picture. So, I mean, that's, that's the, the underlying assumption. Uh, but anybody who floats the idea of empathy rather than uh, a uh, recognition of sameness in uh, co-specifics, uh, which would be a, a kind of neutral term. And if you say empathy, uh, then you got the stage set right there that we like it. Uh, and I think that's one reason why the whole research is catching on. Because now we think we can, and maybe this is also a sign of the times, because we are in a frame of mind, aren't we, these days, where we would so much like be able to like each other and disagree and, and agree about things and not see each other as these social atoms uh, who, who fight each other and so forth because that theory is just, it's, it's for a lot of, of us, it, it's something uh, has, has uh, not shown itself to be terribly successful as a social approach. So we're looking for reasons why we might be that way. And the parallel that I'm thinking of is uh, uh, in paleoanthropology. Paleo in the 80s and 90s, which is also something because I'm interested in, in, uh, in early human intelligence. Uh, what we saw there was a huge shift between uh, the prevailing idea that humans are aggressive by nature, toppling over and being taken over by the view that humans are uh, compassionate by nature. It already started there. And even, uh, shall we say, victims by nature who need to link up with each other so that they don't get eaten by the big predators. So a shift from um, the Raymond Dart style paleoanthropology of the killer ape theory to the Don Johansson and Richard Leakey style of we are fundamentally little people trying to survive on the savannah and we can't do it without each other. So a, a total shift, and I'm actually seeing in paleoanthropology that some people are going back and then dusting off Dart and Ardry and saying, it was kind of interesting, wasn't it? Uh, you know, we are maybe aggressive after all. So swing with popular ideas uh, in the culture, and maybe this is one of them. I would hate to think that that's all right, uh, but it has some, some potential in that direction. Yes. But, but look, the underlying assumption is that these mechanisms we have in the brain are the product of evolution, so there's some selective advantage to having these. Um, now, you can call that violating the naturalistic fallacy if you want, but uh, it, you know, it's, it seems to me that you have to entertain that possibility that you know, things like empathy, compassion, and so on, that there's some advantage that it confers on. Um, and that would, for one thing, explain why we have it. It would explain why it would be somehow objectively good not to disregard it, mm -hmm. but it would not tell us specific cases oh, no, of when of we should no. go with our uh, oh. empathetic sense. No evolutionary theory. Yeah, right, right. Yes. But that, and the question I wanted to raise was, um, and it kind of came from Scott's example of seeing a shadow of an animal. If you think about a cat or a dog, they will recognize their prey because there is in their brain. They don't know, hey, that's a rat or a rabbit. They go after that shape as a brain reaction. And so my, my thought was, well, we don't think of animals. I mean, maybe primates, but we're talking about cats, dogs, lions, tigers. Uh, we don't think of them as really having morals or having ethical questions. 
but they're, they are working on the same kinds of brain structures and chemicals and things that motivate their behavior That's as we too. are. <laughs> you know, and so what is it about humans? It's almost to me we have to look at, approach it from a completely different angle of how do we understand what art is. Uh, you can't take an artist's brain and go, okay, the artist had this chemical, that made his painting great. It's, 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 it's a holistic kind of from the outside in that we have to look at ethics instead of saying, because animals have brain mechanisms that make them behave in evolutionarily successful ways and pack together, but we don't, we're not talking about ethics at the level in animals that That's we do. That's a question. That is a question. Because uh, somebody like Franz Duval is working on uh, developing a, shall we say, basic vocabulary for primate ethics. Uh, and uh, what he does is, well, he looks at the behavior of primates. And he says, if we see the same behavior in human contexts, such as uh, young children behaving, correcting those children, so forth, we call it uh, a moral upbringing or moral correction and so forth. And if apes do it to themselves, uh, uninspired by human beings, why would we just call that instinct? Uh, so he's been working several books now. The um, latest one uh, is uh, ooh, Primates primates and Morals, I think it's called. Uh, he had another one that's called uh, Good Nature, the Origin of Morality on Primates. So of course we should here also be a little bit afraid that he might want to, want for his apes to be moral creatures so that somehow we can raise them up into the level of those who should not be treated merely as a means to an end, or at the you know, lesser creatures. Uh, so he also, I, I am sure that he has his own uh, predisposed, predisposed notions of uh, being moral is being good. My apes are moral, thus they are good, and you should not prey on them, and so forth. Um, but his examples are very compelling of apes recognizing uh, general situations, universalizing, in other words, uh, understanding a, uh, a principle, uh, which, by the way, I did principle floated around before. There was something I want to say. Maybe we can do that. Uh, but understanding that if this is what we are all supposed to do, then you can't do something else because then we will be upset and what we will do is we will ostracize you. We will not groom you. We will not share our food with you until you uh, become one of the gang. And they do this all the time. So if this is what we are willing to call moral behavior, then that means that it's built in. We've got it in the primate brain. And some people are even saying, oh, let's say it even further. Monkey brains, maybe. I don't see that. I don't see any evidence in the researchers where a monkey will step out of his or her way uh, to make sure that an injured monkey will be safe. But apes will do that. Uh, some people claim that dogs will do it. I love dogs, but I have not seen evidence of that. Uh, so maybe we are talking about simply a different level of development in, in the primate brain. Uh, and that would mean that there is something, there's a there there. Uh, there is a predisposition to think of the others as equals or maybe more than equals, to channel Levin asked, uh, somebody who needs my help. Uh, and then we can go back on that as Everybody knows who's interviewed or seen interviews of people helping people after disaster. What is their first reaction? Oh, they want to rush in, in there in the house that's about to fall down and help and give them a second to change their mind and they say, oh, this might be dangerous for me and they're not going to do it. Um, question is, can apes do that? Can they have that second thought? They're, this is another um, brain research thing that they have found the center in the brain for uh, saying, oh, I'm not going to do it. So we don't just have, yes, I am going to do it. We also have a, no, I'm not going to do it, because there's nothing in it for me. Uh, and we have both. I don't know if apes have, no, there's nothing in it for me. But they have more of what we call a, a moral approach to each other than we were used to thinking. This is what the theory is, this is what the whole thing is leading to, that uh, our mind is there isn't anything that's going on in the mind that cannot be found happening in the brain. The question is, can we stop talking about the mind and we'll only talk about brain reactions? Or is there some kind of 
oh, shall we say, consciousness <coughs> reaction to the brain phenomenon that gives us an additional, shall we say, a uh, resonance that is the mind instead of just the brain uh, things. And that, of course, leads to the old question of do we have a soul and so forth. Because that would be, according to this theory, no, sorry, soul doesn't fit in anywhere. But if we can th talk about something that is not exclusively uh, gray matter working on gray matter. Uh, One word, we, we, yeah. Emergence. Right? I'm sorry? Emergence. Ooh, emergence, yeah. complex yes. adapts yes. to yes. things yes. characterized by emergent properties. Yeah. 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 The properties of the whole cannot be reduced yes. to anything yes. yes. such as yeah. 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 Uh, That's where that would be going. Mm -hmm. And it holds up uh, some hope for some of us. Yeah. Okay, and this, this means that people are going to start to filter in for the next event that's going to happen.